It is a great honor for me to get to introduce our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Elaine Weyuker. Weyuker's research focuses on fault prediction, software testing, and metrics and measurements. Dr. Weyuker holds numerous prestigious titles. Um, when she was at AT&T Labs, she was an AT&T Fellow. And before that, she was a professor at, of computer science at New York um, University's Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences. Some of her titles include Member of the National Academy of Engineering, IEEE Fellow, and ACM Fellow. She's also the recipient of several awards recognizing her outstanding contributions to the field of computing, such as the IEEE Harland Mills Award for Outstanding Software Engineering Research, and the ACM SIGSOFT Outstanding Research Award. Dr. Waker is also the recipient of the ACM President's Award, the 2008 Anita Borg Institute Technical Leadership Award, and she has been the chair of the ACM Women's Council since 2004. And this is just a, a short list of all her um, awards, titles, and contributions. Um, my first encounter with Elaine was actually at a Grace Hopper conference many years ago when I was a new graduate student. And for those of you that don't know what Grace Hopper conference is, it's a celebration of women in computing. And as a new graduate student in software engineering, I had read several of her papers. And when I saw her at the conference, I had one of those starstruck moments to meet the person behind those excellent papers. And I can tell you that I was not alone. She was surrounded literally by 20 to 30 students, all trying to get um, to hear what she had to say and get to ask her questions. So it is truly a privilege and an honor to now hand over the word to Dr. Lane Waker. Well, thank you, Christina. <laughs> I'm a little nervous about, you know, now you'll, now you'll be expecting something. And, yeah. You know. um, well, I'm very happy to be here. I've never been to the university before. Uh, I had my first experience in downtown Newark a month ago when I got trapped on the, uh, uh, I got shuttled off the uh, New Jersey Turnpike and found out that there actually was a town of Newark, not just the bypass of the Delaware toll. So this is kind of, this is kind of exciting for me. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about some research that uh, was done jointly for a number of years with Tom Ostrand and uh, to some extent Bob Bell, who's a, a statistician. And the goal of this research is to determine with a high degree of accuracy, which files in a very large software system are likely to contain the largest numbers of bugs in the next release. Now, why is this an important thing to do? Well, if you're a software tester and I could say to you, before the, system, before the release has been written, where the bugs will be, what would you do? Well, you test there first. It's like the old joke about you're looking for your keys under the light. Well, we know where to shine the light. So you, you test there first, you test there hardest, you put your best people there, you use your best, um, your best tools, you allocate the most time for the ones that are, are uh, predicted to be uh, really bad, provided that we were able to get it right and provided that you believed us. And uh, when we, that was the initial motivation because we had worked in testing for many years. And when we spoke to development organizations about this and spoke to testers, uh, we were surprised that the developers were just as excited about this technology because they said, if we could tell them accurately again, where the bugs would be in the next release, they would know uh, who to have write those, those files, who, who, uh, how much time to allocate for them, um, when to, to use very expensive techniques, which they might not normally do. So normally, uh, a design review and a code review are only done at the start of a project. Uh, it's typically not redone 
at later releases because it's simply too expensive to do. But if I could tell them a handful of project, a handful of files that were problematic back here and back here, and I have very good evidence to, to, um, to indicate that it's going to be a problem here, then maybe what you want to do is uh, re-implement it instead of constantly patching it. And finally, this, uh, the, the project managers felt for them, their, their, goal, their job is uh, to allocate resources, personnel resources, uh, time, scheduling, etc. and this would be very helpful for them. So, what did we do? The very first thing that we did was something that initially we hadn't even started, we hadn't even thought about. First thing that we did was to verify that bugs were very non-uniformly distributed. So everybody knows, and you should always beware in science when you base things on everybody knows, or the folklore, everybody knows that there's a Pareto-like distribution. And that means that a small percentage of the files account for the vast majority of the bugs. But what happens if that wasn't really true? Well, then the whole project wouldn't make any sense. The goal is to find the ones that, have that will have unusually large numbers of bugs. If, if bugs are uniformly distributed among the files, then it doesn't even make sense. So the first thing that we did was we found a project that was willing to work with us, and they had 13 releases. These releases were quarterly releases, so it had been in the field for, thir uh, for three years, a little more than three years. And uh, what we did was look at each of the releases and see to what extent you saw a very non-uniform dis distribution. And what we found was that uh, in the first release, about 40% of the files had bugs, and after the first release, there was, it, all the bugs were concentrated in 20 or fewer percent of the files, which, was, which is what the folklore says. But if you're doing science, you also have to uh, see that you really observe that. Okay, then once we knew that, that that was true and the whole project made sense, then what we did was we identified which properties uh, were most likely to, uh, to affect fault proneness. So we did a whole lot of, we spent uh, a couple of years doing studies uh, and with real systems and seeing what kind of characteristics correlated most closely uh, with fault proneness, okay? And once we, we determined those uh, characteristics, what we did was we built a, uh, we weighted them appropriately based on what we had observed in many different releases of, of software systems, and, uh, and then built a statistical model to make predictions, and ultimately we built a tool, but the tool was sort of down the pike. It took a long time till we were ready to do that. So the, pro the properties that we found were most important and correlated most closely with fault proneness was the size of the file in terms of the number of thousands of lines of code, the number of, the changes, number of changes that had made to, been made to the file recently. Once you got farther than, than two releases, it became less and less important how many changes had been made. Uh, the number of bugs in the last release the age of the file, that means how many releases was this file in the system? So the system may be three years old, but this particular file, which corresponds to a particular feature, was added in the last release. And one of the things that we found was that new, re new files were much more likely to be fault prone. Once they got older than a couple of years, then a couple of releases, they were less and less likely to, to, um, 
to be problematic unless they had a lot of changes or a lot of bugs in the past releases. So each of these uh, are, uh, interact with each other. And finally, uh, the language that the file is written in. Um, different kinds of languages have different kinds of fault rates. Okay? Some of them were quite unexpected. Okay? Let me do a quick thing. How about C++ versus Java? How many people think that Java has a higher fault rate? And how many, how many people think Java has a higher fault rate? How many people think C++ has a higher fault rate? Yeah, that's what everybody thinks. That's not what we saw. We found that Java had a much higher fault rate. Now, it may be, I don't know why this is, okay, um, but it may be that the systems that we were looking at mostly were built uh, at AT&T. AT&T was the home of C++. It may be that people were much more adept at writing C++ than Java. These are all professional programmers, all experienced programmers. So, uh, you know, you don't know what, you know, you don't know what the cause is, but you know what you observe, okay? And that's, and that's what's, uh, you know, that's what's built into this. And the, event, the ultimate statistical model that you build is self-adjusting. So it learns from one, from one release to the next, and, it, and it's constantly reweighting each of the factors. So it may be for this system, it's, this is less important, and so as time goes on, a, a particular factor gets uh, weighted less and less. Okay, so where do we get all this information from? Well, uh, all of the systems that we looked at, and I'm gonna show you some of them uh, in a little while, we looked at nine different systems. We made predictions for 170 different releases. And all of these systems used a standard uh, configuration management system, which integrated version control and change management system and, and kept track also of the uh, bug history. Anytime you wanted to make change, any kind of change for any reason, whether it's an enhancement, it's a new feature, uh, it's a, a, a bug fix, for any reason at all, you have to initiate a modification request, which everybody calls an MR, and, uh, and you enter a whole lot of English stuff, you know, unstructured English, describing why things like why you want to make the change and what you think the reason and what you think is going to happen. And because it's also the version control system, the actual code is there. And if you actually make a change to the, to the system as a result of this MR, uh, the, the actual change is there. So you can actually roll the system back to any time point that you want and see exactly what was there or roll it, you know, or, and then roll it back forward. So um, we know that the, because, ver, uh, because version control is integrated in this, we know that we were capturing every single change that's made to the system because you cannot get the code out without writing this MR. So one of the problems that some of the other people uh, who do research similar to this have had was that they don't have this integration, and so people are making changes that never get recorded. That's not the situation here. Any, you know, any change that's made for any reason has been captured. Okay, um, and what we did was we ultimately built a tool that extracted from this underlying data repository all the information that we needed for, uh, to make the predictions. And at the very end, I'll mention some other things that we tried as factors, uh, which we were also able to get from this repository. So this is an enormous repository, and uh, the back end of our tool is a data miner. Okay, 
We use the negative binomial regression model. This is a standard type of statistical model. Um, a lot of people who do similar work have used uh, machine learning algorithms. Um, and we tried, we tried some of them. Uh, three of the most popular ones are recursive partitioning, uh, random forests, and uh, Bayesian techniques. We use particularly BART, which is uh, one particular Bayesian package. Um, what we found was that uh, negative binomial regression outperformed all of them. Uh, it made much better predictions than either recursive partitioning or the Bayesian technique. And uh, for some systems, it was equivalent to uh, random forests, but random forests were much, much more expensive, much more uh, uh, compute intensive because you build many, many, many trees. And one of the essential things, if you want practitioners to use it, you have to get results in what they perceive as real time. You know, so if, it, if you can get res results for a multi-million line system in under a minute, that's the end of the game. They're not interested. Um, so for our, for our uh, purposes, negative binomial regression uh, both gave you the best accuracy in terms of making the predictions and the best speeds. Okay, so the prediction tool consists of two parts, basically a back end, which, uh, which is this data mining that, data miner that extracts the, uh, the data that's needed for the predictions for your model, and that comes from this underlying repository from the configuration management system, and a front end uh, that actually makes the predictions, which is the, this uh, bino negative binomial regression uh, package. Um, our goal was, our intention was that we would have lots of different backends. So your project uses a different kind of configuration management system. We would have lots of different backends, and the tool. Uh, has an intermediate form, you might say, uh, which is just a tabular form of all the information that you need, and then that's piped on to the, uh, the um, prediction engine. We net all of the projects that we wound up getting access to at at and and another company all use the same configuration management system, and therefore we never built any other backends. So, uh, the tool, as it works now, has a data miner for a particular configuration management system uh, and, and this uh, prediction engine part, um, which, which was, as far as the user is concerned, is a seamless single tool. Okay, so uh, we, extract, um, we extract the data from the repository, we make the predictions, uh, we, the tool then sorts the files into decreasing number, uh, based on the predicted number of faults, so in decreasing order. And so the way to think about it is the first file is, says, test me first, I'm going to have the most bugs. The next file is test me next. Third file is test me after that. And, um, and then it displays the results to the, to the user. So now we needed a way of, because we're researchers, and on the one hand, we, we want this to be used by practitioners. On the other hand, uh, we're also doing science and we're also writing papers and, and publishing it. So we needed a way to uh, assess how successful our predictions were, uh, A, to win over potential customers, uh, and B, so that we can, you know, tell the world about our results. And uh, what we used was uh, the percentage of actual bugs that occurred in the n percent of the files that the tool says 
are predicted to have the largest numbers of bugs. So typically we send n and equal to 20. So this says the way we're saying how well we're doing is what percentage of bugs actually occurred in the 20% of the files that we said would be worse, okay? Why did we pick 20 f uh, f uh, for uh, describing this in papers? Well, there's the Pareto-like distribution, which says 20% of the files should contain roughly 80% of the bugs. So if we look at the worst 20% and then say, what percentage were actually in that worst 20%, if we can get something like 80%, that means we're getting, you know, we're doing about as well as you can possibly do. Okay? So, um, the, the other reason that we used this kind of, uh, this kind of metric was that we spoke with, with the practitioners who are our customers, and I think of, you know, people who use my tool as my customers, um, and we said, what would convince you that we've, that we've done well? And we suggested a variety of different things. And this is the one that made sense to them. If you can tell me that if I look at the top 20% of the files or the top n percent of the files, I'm going to get a large percentage of the bugs. That's what I want to know. So we also considered other measures which were, and we, and we described them in some of our papers, which were more interesting to us, um, but didn't make sense to practitioners. And basically, it smooths it over all values of n. So it's less sensitive to whether you pick 19% or 20% or 21%. OK, so let me tell you, oops, no. Yeah. Uh, so these are nine real systems. Uh, there's a lot of diversity in these systems. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, NP is an inventory control system. It's written in Java. Um, it, well, I'll tell you that. Okay. WN is a service provisioning system. It, that means it initiates a service for your customers. Uh, it's basically a database system, and so the largest number of files, uh, the, the language that's most, that most files are written in is SQL, but that only accounted for about 25% of the files, and then there were C++ files, and there were a lot of other things, and we thought that was heterogeneous until we got to VT, which is one of those... Um, automated response, uh, voice response systems, those things that you never get to speak to a human being, you know, that everybody detests. Well, that's a lot of AT&T's, that's one of AT&T's businesses. And uh, this, the, at the end, the last release, and this is, it wasn't exactly a release, and that's another story. Um, there were thir uh, lang uh, files written in 34 different executable languages. And if you say you didn't know there were 34 different executable languages, neither did we. Uh, a lot of them were these special... Per so some of them we could look at and say, ah, oh, this is some kind of a scripting language. It's not awk, it's not Perl, it's not this, it's not that but it's some kind of a scripting language, or this is a, a C++ like, or a, a Java-like language, or, you know, and some we couldn't tell what they were. We couldn't even tell whether they were executable or not, and so we had to go to them. And uh, so what they did was they wrote certain special purpose languages to do some very special uh, speech processing things, and they might have one or two files written in in each of a whole bunch of different languages. Um, TS, TW, and TE were very interesting because they came from another corporation, okay? We managed to get another corporation who was interested enough in this and used the same configuration management system to let us uh, 
experiment with their software. So this was written and maintained by another, not AT&T. And um, these were all, these were all initially C systems. They were very mature. They eventually became C++ systems, which basically meant they were still C systems, but they were run with a C++ compiler. Um, and then the last three systems were, and they were all business management systems. And the last three systems were AT&T systems. Um, okay, they were, so they were written in different languages. They did different things. They were written by different corporations. They were very different levels of maturity. Uh, WN and BT, we caught at the very beginning of their lives, and we followed them for about two years. Um, TSTW were in the field for almost 10 years. We followed them for, we made predictions for all of their releases. Uh, TE was also very mature. Uh, and then the other four were in between. Um, this says how many releases we made predictions for. It totaled 170 of them. Uh, they varied in size from under 300,000 lines of code to more than 2.1 million lines of code. And the one thing that was uh, uniform about all of them was basically the results. And here's another way of looking at that last column. This says that if the top 20% of the uh, I think there are 17 releases of NP, average over the, seven, uh, the, the top, uh, the top 20% uh, percent average over the 17 releases uh, contained 83% of the actual bugs that occur. Uh, and so what you see is a surprising uniform, uniformity. This one was the worst that we saw was 75% uh, and part of the reason that that was a little bit less, um, less successful than some of the other uh, systems was they used what they called continuous releases. They did not have a, uh, a regular release uh, process. Uh, you might call it an agile project. Uh, that would be being very kind. Uh, this was a project that was having a lot of problems and was kind of thrashing. And um, so they were constantly fixing and debugging. It's not that they had an agile process, although they tried to put a good spin on it afterwards. Um, and so the technique was designed to predict the future, and what we <coughs> meant by the future was the next release based on the past, and what does the past mean? mean? It means previous releases. And if you have, a, a, say, a quarterly release schedule, a three-month schedule, the way it standardly works is roughly halfway through the three-month period, roughly after six weeks, all code is frozen and sent to your system testers. And that's the point at which we were making predictions. The only changes that get made to that code are to fix bugs that are found in system test or end-to-end -end test or operations readiness test. The code base in that release is uh, copied over to the next release. And so typically you have three act, a minimum of three active releases. You have one in the field, one in system test, one on deck where you're adding new features. Um, so, so there's, you know, there's this, there's a semantics that goes with a process like that. You know, during the six weeks uh, that the that the code is in test, you know, there's this very very intensive testing process going on, and it gets sent to system test after very thorough unit testing has been done and integration testing. And the developers really believe they've tested out all, uh, all bugs. 
when you have what they had, what they, they were, we just put down calendar barriers. We made what we called synthetic releases. So there was no, there was no testing process going on. We were, we would just, uh, we just put down January 1st, April 1st, July 1st, October 1st, as, as if those were, um, uh, as, though, if the, as if those were the dates of, of the new release. Um, so we were surprised, actually, and very pleased that we did this well. And you'll see that for three of the systems, um, our predictions exceeded 90%. This is really, you know, uh, pretty good. So one of the questions that you might ask, or one of the questions that we did ask is, okay, so here the top 20% of the files on average included 83% of the bugs. Well, what about this, the remaining 17% of the bugs, of, of the bugs? Were there one or two dreadful files that we missed? Or was it that, you know, there were a whole bunch of files that had one or two bugs in them? I would say that if you had one or two dreadful files that you're missing, then the, then the algorithm is not really working. You'd never want to be able, you never want to miss some terrible situations. And so the next thing that we looked at was exactly that. What are we missing? And so this is, um, this is for the first system. We looked at this for all of the systems. They all look the same. There's no point in showing you the same thing over and over again. Uh, unfortunately, for some reason, the version of, uh, of PowerPoint, these were the, these were the uh, captions. So that's what they're, they're just floating around now. Okay, so what is this, what are these graphs? Well, these are, Release three through 17. Why did we start at re release three? Because I mentioned that uh, one of the factors that we use is how many bugs were in the two prior, uh, how many changes were made in the two prior releases. So we usually start from release three and also how many bugs were in the last release. Uh, you could start from release one, but then you have nothing for. Um, for how many changes were in the prior two releases. You have nothing for how many bugs were in the prior releases. Uh, and you have nothing for the age. They're all the same age. They're all new. And so basically what you have is just the size, which is not a dreadful predictor, but it's not very interesting, okay? Uh, and we did look at you know, you do pretty well just looking at the size of the files, uh, but not nearly as well as you do uh, by looking at the full model. So uh, this is release three and along the, uh, or and through 17, along the x-axis in each case, uh, you have the files, each individual file in the system, ordered by the predicted number of bugs. So the file that was predicted to have the largest number of bugs is up at the, at the uh, origin, and then the one next to that is the one predicted to have the next largest number of bugs. The dotted red lines we put there just for reference, those are the 20% mark. And the height of the bars is the actual number of bugs that were in that file. So what do you expect? You expect all the tall bars, if this is working well, you expect all the tall bars uh, to be to the left of the uh, dotted line, and uh, all of the bars to the right either to be non-existent, which means they had no bugs, or to be very short. And that's basically what you have. We never miss a bad uh, file. Usually, the absolute worst file is the first file we, we pick. Um, so by and large, we're never missing uh, really awful things. Now, let me tell you about the tool. Um, okay, so one of the important things about the tool is that it has to be fully automated, it has to be fast, 
and it can't require the user to need to know data mining, to need to know statistics, to need to know what were the factors that we used in the tool. They just need a tool, okay? They need something that, um, that works uh, miraculously. And so they supply, they supply a few parameters, and I'm going to show you what they are. Um, and, and then there's this data, uh, the, the, um, the version control system, the configuration management system from which data is mined. And together that information goes into the statistical analyzer, which is fed to the prediction, prediction engine along with uh, information that the user provides about which release they want to make predictions from. And then come the fault proneness uh, predictions. Okay, so what does it look like? This is a very simple um, interface, GUI interface that we, that we built for this tool. Uh, this is a real system. The only thing that's been changed is the name and the name of the files. Um, okay, so the system is called you know, the user says, I want you to make predictions for my system, which is called Bluestone. The tool automatically populates this field with all releases that have occurred for the system Bluestone, listed in chronological order. And sometimes, for whatever reason, this one is very nicely behaved, and there's a slide bar, so there were a lot more releases, but... Um, um, Sometimes they have very creative, this one had obvious uh, numbering scheme. They had the year and then it was released one, two, three, and four per year. They had quarterly releases. Uh, it's not always the case, but in any case they would be ordered chronologically. Okay. Um, and then the user says which, which releases they want to use as part of the analysis. Okay, so they've said what system they, ha want, they have and which, which of the releases uh, are important to them. Then they're asked, ah, this is an interesting point. Then they're asked, uh, what do you want to call a bug? All right, this system has no field that says, is this a bug? Yes, no, I don't know. Okay, I would have thought that that would be an obvious thing to have. It turns out it's not uncommon for, for, um, for these configuration management systems not to include a, a, a field for saying whether or not it's a bug. Um, so we went to the testers and we went to the developers and we said, how are we going to decide what's a bug? And they both told us the same thing. If a system tester or beyond finds, if a tester finds it and a change is made as a result of, of this, then it's a bug. Because testers don't get to say, add this nice new feature, uh, change this functionality. Their job is solely to look for bugs or what they perceive to be bugs. Um, and so, this user selected, and this is a real user who was using it. We just basically captured what he did. Uh, he chose uh, anything found in system test. You can choose uh, multiple. You can choose multiple um, phases. So some people will use system test uh, end to end and operations readiness plus anything in the field. Typically, these systems have virtually no field faults. Almost everything is picked up during, um, during system test or later. If we were working with Microsoft systems, for example, you might see something very different. No comment, okay? Uh, not a value judgment. Um, and as a matter of fact, some, of the, some very, very good researchers at Microsoft did something similar, and they said, well, why would you be interested in finding bugs before it's out in the field? 
And we said, well, our goal is to make sure our customers never see bugs, which they thought was an aberrant notion. You know, that, uh, you know, well, it's not a bug if, the, if your customers haven't found it for you. So anyway, uh, so he picked the uh, system test. Then it says, which file types are you interested in? What's populated here is the extension of every file. All right? So this user said, I'm interested in C files. I'm interested in C++ files. I'm interested in Java files. And this is a proprietary uh, language, which is C++ with embedded SQL. He could have picked as many different languages as he wanted. He said, these are the four types of languages he wants to make predictions for. Um, which, and then they're asked, generic is the word that at and uses for release. So he's asked, for which, for which release did you want to make a prediction? And uh, he said he wanted to make it for 208.1. Uh, that was the most recent release. This was the rollover. I said when it, it's about to go to system test, they roll over to the next release. They, they roll the code over. So this is a non-existent release. So he's asking to make a prediction for the most recent release, the one that's going to system test. And then um, he's asked, um, is, is this what you really wanted? Namely, you want to use these releases. You want to call this a bug. You want to use these. Um, you want to make predictions for those kinds of files. And he says, yes. Um, this says, where do you want to put the results? Give me the name of a file to put your results in. And so that's what he named it. And then you pull the handle, and out comes the answers. What did the user need to know? He needed to know what system he's working on. He needed to know what release he wants to make a prediction for. He needed to know uh, what kind of languages he was interested in. He didn't need to know anything about data mining. He didn't need to know anything about statistics. He didn't need to know anything about you know, what's going on behind the screen. All he needed to know was stuff that every practitioner knows, namely, what is the system I'm working on, basically. Um, and here are, this will show you some. So this shows all of the languages. It turns out that the, this was a system that, um, OK, all the worst files were Java files. This was also a system that was primarily Java. It was uh, something like 75 to 80% of the files were written in Java. This was a very unusual system. Uh, it was predicted that 36% of the bugs would be in one particular file. The next worst file would have another 11% of the bugs. This is a very, very skewed system. And it turned out that that was, uh, that was actually close to right. And we pro provide a cumulative percentage. So another way, instead of asking for the worst n percent, right now it's at 100%. This is a slide bar. Um, um, another thing you, you could say is, show me which files which together would account for 75% of the bugs, for example. So you look down here and you'd say, well, these 17 or 18 files together would account for 75% of the bugs, or you could slide down and look for 90% of the bugs and decide um, you know, what, what your threshold is. Um, okay, he could ask for only, uh, only the EC files, and you see that they contain, they're predicted to contain almost no bugs. Um, you could look for just the top 10% or any percentage you want of these EC files. Um, okay, the tool is fully operational. We wrote it 
750 lines of Python, that's not much. Uh, 2,100 lines of C, that's not much. Um, it's small. So currently we have a single, currently we have a single backend, namely this AT&T configuration management system. Um, but all you need to do is be able to extract that data from whatever system you're using, put it into this intermediate tabular form, and then you can make the predictions from that. Okay, so when I do it in smaller, less formal settings, I mean, here it's kind of, you know, intimidating to just interrupt and ask questions. So the most common question I'm, I'm asked is, why didn't you include developers? I mean, clearly, I know that Joe is a great programmer, and if he's written the code, it will be really good and not have bugs. And Sam is terrible, and anything he touches is full of bugs. And so, and everybody thinks, everybody's intuition is that they know that. You know, they know who's going to predict, uh, produce buggy code and not. Initially, we decided that we were not going to do that because we were dependent on these very same Joes and Sams to give us access to their systems, to give us a lot of feedback, to be our customers, and they were terrified at the prospect that this would be used somehow to evaluate them. Okay? Not good. So we said we're not using developers, and as a matter of fact, we told the management we couldn't use developers. Developers was not something we would be able to incorporate in the model, and since they didn't have any idea what we were doing, they just, you know, believed it. After, after we built the model and had made predictions for 170 releases, and we saw that work very well, and we had projects that were interested in this, we also had 170 releases worth of data that we could play with without telling them that we were playing with it. You know, so we could do some research. Um, and so we looked at augmenting the model with a variety of things. One was two different ways of looking at the impact of developers. One is individuals, Joe and Sam. And the other was simply counts. The idea is too many cooks spoil the broth. So if lots and lots of people are mucking with this file, you'd think it's probably going to have a lot of bugs in it, or either cumulatively over the whole life cycle, over the whole lifetime of the system, or in the most recent release, or maybe there were new people uh, working on this file who had never worked on this file before and therefore didn't know anything about it, maybe that would make it. So what was interesting was we looked at these things and we were actually very surprised to see they weren't good predictors at all. In fact, the only thing that had any positive, statistically significant impact was the total number of um, the total number of different developers who touched the system over the lifetime, and that made a difference of under 1%, and sometimes it made it worse. Okay, the other two ways of counting, uh, on average, it gave you zero improvement and often made it worse. Um, individuals was very interesting to see. It did not give you an improvement. And for one of the projects, we asked the uh, manager, give us the names of the people that you consider your very best people on this project, and give us the, peop the names of the people who are either the least talented or perhaps new and trainees and, and not really experienced developers. Uh, we're just curious to look at that information. And then we went and looked at their fault rates. Well, in a lot of cases, the most, the best, the most had 
high fault rate. And why was that? Well, what do you give to your best people? The hardest things to do. And you also give them the files that were mucked up by somebody else in earlier releases and now make them right, fix them up. And what do you give to your failure or your beginner? You give them things that they can't muck up. So one of the things, the first thing that triggered it was there was this guy who was on his uh, uh, non-excellent list who had changed 130 some odd files during the previous release and had almost zero bugs in any of the files that he had changed. Wow, what do you mean? So then you go and look and, what, and see what he's done. Well, so for example, they've added a new parameter to a file. So everything that, call, that calls it needs to have comma x added to it. So he's changed 37 different files by writing comma x. And you know what? He managed to get them all right. So, so you can really get, you know, so, so you can really get misled by, by what your intuition says sometimes. Another thing that we did was we looked at calling structure, the impact of calling structure. So, um, again, we kind of thought that, um, well, if you have this file, and it's really problematic, and it's calling this file, maybe it's passing bad stuff to it. And therefore, these files are going to be uh, problematic too. Nah. And if it was called, nah. These, we saw nothing, uh, you know, nothing statistically significant there. We looked at what happens if the calling, if we looked at the calling structure, the calling and called files, and they were new, or they were changed, or they were buggy. You know, no, didn't make uh, didn't make any difference. Um, people suggested, well, maybe you could get even better results if if you had more fine grained. Uh, we didn't have fine grained uh, any way of finding out the fine grained uh, number of lines that had been added deleted or changed. All we could do initially was count the number of changes that were made, but we couldn't get below that. Um, eventually, somebody uh, figured out how to do it. So the developer said there was no way of getting to that information from this configuration management system. And we found out that knowing the number of lines that were changed didn't make any difference either. So basically, um, the only thing that might make sense to add to the model is the total number of people who had, different people who had changed the system over the lifetime. And while that might give you something like a 0.7%, that is less than 1% improvement, you might also do worse. And we decided that we were not going to uh, add that. Um, OK. So uh, maybe you're a graduate student and you're looking for something to do. This is a really interesting field. You know, what kind of things are, are still left? Well, I think there's lots of things to do. We never looked at open source systems. And we published the models. We published the details of the models. One thing very good about AT&T at the time was that they let us publish anything we wanted. Um, one of the questions, you had to send the paper for release. One of the questions was, do you want somebody to look at this? And my answer was always no. <laughs> so um, if, if you said no, then they didn't bother sending it to, uh, to the lawyers or to the IP people or to the, you know, and they just let you go ahead and publish it. So. Um, we publish the models, the details. Are there other models that could be built, um, you know, that were more accurate? Maybe there are some other things that we haven't thought of looking at. 
um, what's the best way to actually use these if you're a development organization. Um, in, for these systems, this tool, uh, the reason we made predictions at the file level is that's how data is kept in this configuration management system. But if you have a tool that does it at the method level, for example, uh, it's more desirable to make predictions at, in the smaller, finer grained units. Why? Because your, your goal is to, uh, to help with uh, fault localization. The smaller units you can point to, the better off you are in terms of finding the bugs. So some of the other research looked at much, much, much uh, less fine grain than files. They looked at uh, whole subsystems, which basically, as far as I was concerned, didn't tell you much. If you find out that these bugs would be in these 50,000 lines of code, well, thank you very much, you know. Uh, typically, what did I do? I don't think I did anything. Um, anyway, there's a bunch more. Um, oops. Okay. Um, can you use runtime attributes? We never looked at that. Um, but that's something that would be interesting to look at. Um, and are there better metrics to use than the worst 20%? And then there were all kinds of engineering things to do, like, you know, building, um, you know, doing different back ends. And what happens if you have a configuration management system or a change management system that doesn't have all the information that we use? What happens if you only have uh, three of these factors? Can, what, what kind of predictions can you make? Um, that, I think that's a very interesting question because I think a lot of the configuration management systems don't integrate both version control and change management. Um, uh, it certainly needs a better interface and uh, it should be a web-based tool which we never built. And, um, and our a goal was to integrate this into the standard process. We were very lucky the people who uh, own the configuration management system loved this, and so they had embedded it into the dashboard. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Tom Ostrand and myself both left and now uh, Nobody knows how to use it without us, so. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I think there's lots of, lots of stuff that one could do. I think that this is a very ripe topic. One of the, the questions that we were also interested in looking at was, and I'm still interested in looking at, is could we make similar predictions for, vulner for uh, security vulnerabilities? That's a specific type of bug, after all. And wow, wouldn't it be great if we could say a priori where security vulnerabilities were likely to be? And I don't know if you could do it. That's what research is about. But I think that would be a very interesting thing uh, to look at. Um, anyway, uh, I hope you found this a little bit interesting. And uh, if there are any quick questions, I'm happy to, to try to answer them. Uh, I know what happened. It ran out of time. Okay, because it's now reset. Okay. Okay, this is much nicer to look at. Okay, yeah? Well, well, certainly, 
So certainly you can compute an average number. And the question is, from system to system, uh, yeah, so, or from file to file. So, um, and this is one of the reasons that the language that it's written in makes a difference. So if you have a, uh, something like a scripting language, which uh, one statement does a lot of stuff, as opposed to uh, a medium level language like, um, Java or C++, as opposed to assembly language, you know, where, so the fault rates would be very low in an assembly language and medium for even in the same quality code, because, you know, much less is being done in a single statement. And that's why language counts, at least part of the reason that language counts. Yeah. So on average, what percentage of the code Okay, that's a very, very interesting question. I don't know if you heard what he asked. He asked what percentage of the code did the 20% of the lines of code did the 20% of the files account? So if they account, because one of the factors was size. So if they accounted for 80% of the code, then you might say, well, what good is that? Well, there are two answers to that. The answer is, in general, it was something like uh, 40 to 50 percent of the code. So it's more than 20 percent, but much less than the percentage of bugs we are finding. Okay. So that's the first answer. Uh, yes, it still makes a difference. The other thing is, system test is done as a purely black box testing. So initially, we were going to look at and make predictions on fault density for exactly that reason. Fault density means uh, bugs per uh, normalized by length of, of code. The practitioners, the testers said, no, 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 that doesn't make sense from our point of view because we don't see the code. We're doing black box testing. We're testing from, we're testing features uh, based, on, uh, based on the specification. We don't know if there are, we don't, we don't uh, develop more test cases for, because there are longer, uh, because there's more code, uh, because we don't know that. And so um, if it were the fact that, uh, that the time taken to test things was proportional to the size of code, that would matter. But it's not the case. So, in fact, A, it is a win from the point of view. It's far less, uh, far less code is uh, in these 20% of the code than the percentage of bugs you're finding. But B, from the practitioner's point of view, it doesn't make any difference, according to them. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. Uh, your description of the process so far has been as an open loop predictor. Uh, a what? I can't an open loop predictor. So you have a history of releases, and you look at how the previous release informs the bug profile of the current release, and, and, the, and so on and so forth recursively. Um, but once this is being used in a production environment where we're allocating resources based on a prediction, how will that allocation of resources affect the prediction for the future? I mean, as so, yeah, that's a very, very interesting question and something that we've thought about a lot and we don't know the answer to. So, you know, potentially you can put yourself out of business, except that the model is self-adjusting. So as, as things, as things um, become less important, it weights it less, less. So we think that that would not be a problem. But we don't actually know. Yeah? So did you evaluate the uh, false alarm rate? I can't hear. I oh. can't. Did you evaluate the false alarm rate? Like how many percentage of files do not actually have bugs in your prediction? Because if I'm an individual developer, I I, I use your system, your system says maybe these are 25 weak spots. 
and I spent a long time digging to the files and found that like the top 10 files actually does not have any files. And then I made this give up. Okay. But that never, that, so, if you look at, um, you know, what we're missing, that slide that said what you're missing, the top, fi fi the top files all have a bunch of bugs in them. It's, you know, so, w it, yes, that could happen, but no, we never observed that to happen. So, in fact, we were always getting uh, all the files that we're predicting in the top 10 or 20 percent are typically the ones that you want. You may have one or two files that, that were wrong, but, um, and we're certainly not saying don't test everything. That's, that's not the message. The message is how to prioritize your resources. It's not, you know, it's not don't test the whole, si you don't need to test the whole system. All you need to do is test the worst ones. You know, that's not it. It's just saying uh, this should help you find things fast. You know, the goal of every uh, system is to, is to build the system with no bugs and as inexpensively as possible. If we can tell you before you release the system how to find the bugs faster, you should get, the system should wind up with uh, a higher degree of reliability because you have more time to test things harder. And you should be able to do it more economically because you're finding things faster. Yeah. Uh, you know, we thought about that, and we really didn't have a good, I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, we didn't have good ways of characterizing bugs. So that's, you know, what I just said was I'd love to look particularly for security bugs. So you could try characterizing bugs in some way, but then there's a, a lot of, stuff to go through manually to, um, to try to tag them and see which of these you're getting and which ones you're missing and whether or not. But that, you know, that would be a great project for a graduate student to spend a lot of their time on. <laughs> it, would be, it would be a unique, I mean, if you could in some way characterize what kinds of bugs these, these kinds of predictors are good at finding, I, I think that would be a very, very interesting, um, you know, codification that nobody has, you know. And we really wanted to try to do security for obvious reasons, you know. Yeah. Okay, just one question. Uh, were you able to get uh, AT&T to, uh, to update uh, its own software control system uh, based on uh, based on the information that uh, you were extracting, uh, and maybe additional information that would be more helpful uh, in being able to do this process? One thing we managed, so there's no such thing as getting AT&T to do anything, because, well, I mean, <laughs> well, that's another issue, but there are 300,000 employees in AT&T and a million different subsidiaries, and they all do different processes, so uh, that the project, the VT project that I mentioned that used what they call continuous releases, um, I used to get asked very frequently, um, you know, I get I give talks at, at industrial uh, meetings, and uh, people would say, oh, I work at a company, and we don't have such a, a rigorous process. Do you think um, you could, you know, you could, uh, your tool would work for our systems that, doesn't, that don't have nice releases? And I very stupidly and naively said, oh, at AT&T, we always have a release schedule, and this is mandated, and blah, blah, blah. And of course, the next system that came along didn't follow what was mandated at all. And so the answer is, uh, so the one thing we did 
get the people who own the configuration management system, who were very, very uh, enthusiastic about this uh, work, um, to do was to add a field, uh, is this a bug, yes, no, I don't know. And a few projects used it, but most projects uh, said they preferred not to, which, you know, we can't make anybody do anything. I mean, this is, you know, we say, well, that would make the predictions better because we know what really are bugs and what really are not instead of this approximation, you know, and the answer is, you know, this is the way we've done it forever, you know, and uh, it works fine for us. And, and that's the best we could do. Uh, we did get projects that really wanted this to be part of their standard development process. Um, AT&T did not want us, so this was kind of, you know, we're in research, we were a couple of the, most researchers don't want to have anything to do with practitioners because, you know, and most practitioners don't want to have anything to do with researchers, so it's very nice. Everybody rolls their eyes when they meet each other, you know. Um, we loved working with practitioners, and we generally had very good relations with them because we really listened to them, and we really wanted to do something that would be usable by them and make their lives easier. And... Um, so, you know, there were a bunch of projects that really wanted to embed it in their process. And up until uh, about a month before it became clear that, so the management changed, but before it became clear that this was not a place that we wanted to be anymore, um, they had sent us to a subsidiary in Israel, and they had sent us to a subsidiary in California that were both ready to integrate this into their standard process and needed us to spend some time with them, which we were happy to do um, to help them to help them get started, and then it would be theirs to run with. And uh, AT&T decided our time was too valuable to waste on helping their development projects, which is what, you know, which is what their customers saw. So I don't understand what they were thinking. And uh, so they basically pulled the plug and said that uh, if they were going to use it, they'd have to use it without us helping them get started, which unfortunately was you know, completely infeasible. Okay, thank you very much.